currency, that what I really want to do is compare them. If we look at the, the counterfeit and then we look at the real thing, we can appreciate the real thing better when we can compare them. Um, so before we start, let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for allowing us to be here as we open your word, the truth of your word. And uh, it's you, Lord, who actually teaches us as we, you bring back to our remembrance the things that we learn in your word. It's you who teach us uh, throughout the week and throughout the days. And I pray that your spirit will uh, teach us as we look at your word and consider it, meditate upon it, and help us, Lord, to walk in your spirit. Um, thank you, Lord, that we're here. Thank you, Lord, this is Manna Bible Baptist Church. And I pray, Father, that your spirit will work in a supernatural way as we just look at uh, the wrong worldview and then we look at the right worldview as through Jesus Christ. I pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. So thank you for being here. <laughs> if you were not here, we would not be a community and I would be here talking to myself. <laughs> so thank you for being here. And just as I said, thank you for this is Man of Bible Baptist Church. We look at the, at the world through his, his word and keeps us mentally stable, <laughs> emotionally stable. And I'm sure you know what I mean. Um, we would be way off in our worldview in our, in, in our thinking if we did not rely on the Holy Spirit to real, reveal God's truth. It's an indispensable principle that I'm not really the teacher. I may be a vessel, but it's the Spirit. Look, the Holy Spirit teaches us. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I have it, don't have it together. I have not arrived. And so you pray for me, and I pray for you. So, so thank you for being here, and I pray that the Spirit will speak to us. Um, Brother Rideout, can you cut off those lights over top the screens and kind of those lights kind of make it harder to uh, glare so just those lights thank you and I think uh, can everybody see the screen okay I'm just all right okay um, so just an introduction from last week we were looking at the worldview um, of Islam, and there was a clip that I showed of Muhammad Ali. I just want to make one thing clear: that's the nation of Islam. It's a sect of Islam, of Muslims, and some. I don't. Sometimes they don't recognize the nation of Islam as being truly Islam. But um, it's, in a nutshell, it's the wrong worldview. Um, and so, for just a few minutes, these are some of the sixteen different worldviews. We we looked at. Uh, maybe three weeks ago, we looked at the one called the naturalist, materialist, naturalist. They basically consider life from what they, from a scientific point of view, all they can think, um, uh, hear, see, smell, taste, touch, senses. And last week we looked at um, the Islamic or Muslim worldview. And I want to review a little bit about that. Uh, it, and we looked at the, it's called the five pillars of Islam. Just review in a nutshell, what does the Muslim believe? If you meet a Muslim, we should have an idea of where they're coming from. Um, and so um, the, and so the five, the five pillars of Islam, um, faith, Prayer, charity, fasting, your pilgrimage to Mecca, the faith. Um, for a person to claim to be a Muslim, at some point in their life, they must make a, what they call a declaration of faith. The declaration of faith goes something like this. There is no God but, uh, but um, Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger, something like that. They have to sincerely believe it. They say there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger. That's their declaration of faith. Um, prayer. Muslims pray five times a day. The practicing Muslim will pray five times a day, and those prayers 
uh, the names of them are determined by the times where they pray. Charity. Muslims believe in compulsory, compulsory, compulsory uh, compulsive give. It's not free will giving. They must give. Charity. It's called um, char or charitable giving, alms giving. They must do that. Um, fasting. Muslim fast. I have a co worker who's a Muslim, and during a month of Ramadan, she fasts from sun up to sundown, like 16 hours a day. And I respect that. You go without food because of something. I, I respect that. I don't think it's for the right reason, but I do respect it. Um, and so they fast for, you know, uh, ritual fasting, fasting as compensation for repentance. We do something wrong, well, I'll fast to make it right. Or um, ascetic fasting. You want to be closer to God, then fast. And then they also, a um, practicing Muslim will make, at some point, every able-bodied Muslim should make the pilgrimage of the Hajj. That's called, uh, um, every able-bodied Muslim is obliged to make the pilgrimage to Mecca at least once in their life. And that's what Malcolm X did. He, was, he made the pilgrimage of the Hajj. And if you know a, a practicing Muslim, they may do go over to um, I think it's part of Africa, and they will do that. And so those are the five pillars of, of the Muslim belief system. And it's based on works of man. And if we compare Islam and Christianity, Christianity is based on what Jesus has already done. Um, and so that's a big difference. Um, and in Romans, I think the evening Bible study has been going through Romans. OK. In the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 3, it's like a, in the first, um, first three chapters of Romans, it's building a, Paul is building a case. Um, he's, he's building a, a case, and he's saying he's showing, describing how depraved mankind is. The first three chapters of Romans, Paul builds the case that all of humanity is depraved. We all have fallen short of, of God's perfect standard. And the blood of Christ is a just and perfect ground for complete acceptance before God. For example, in 1 uh, 21, it talks about but a righteousness that comes from God. Now, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. And so there's a, a righteousness that comes from, from God, and he imputes the, righteous, the perfect righteousness of Christ into our bank account. We are, we are utterly um, void to pay for our, our sins, but it, Christ, uh, God imputes the righteousness of Christ into our bank account. And so we are justified. In verse um, 23, we all familiar with that verse, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned. Paul is making that case. Gentiles and Jews all have fallen short. The, the, um, the law is the mirror to show us that we fall short. And we were looking at Ravi Zacharias a little early. He said, you don't use the mirror to get clean. You can't use the mirror. It just shows you. It's like this teaches you how far short, how far depraved we are. And so all have fallen short. Jews, Gentiles, Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus, everybody had fallen short. And in verse 22 and 26 talks about faith in Christ, 22 through faith in Jesus Christ. In verse 26, um, that he might be just and the justifier of the, of the one who has faith in Jesus. And the Muslim puts faith in Allah and Muhammad. And Christians, we put our faith in Jesus Christ. And I'm going to show a clip by a former Muslim and make it, make it more practical and understandable. The two don't match. One is right, and the other, or the other one is right. You say there are two. They, we don't coexist. You choose one or choose the other. You have to choose Christianity or you choose Islam. The two don't 
go together. Um, and also in verse 24, it talks about redemption. Um, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, the blood pays the price for our sin. And then in verse 25, it talks about propiti propitiation. Uh, the righteousness of God the Father is satisfied by the blood of Jesus Christ. All that is, is found in the Christian worldview. And we should know, we should be very familiar with and understand what we believe as Christians and know it well. Um, hmm? The righteousness of God. The wrath. Well, we all are under his wrath. We all, everybody, Muslims, Buddhists, all those 16 different worldviews I showed, we're all under his wrath. And only, and that's one of the beauties of, of Christianity. We look at Jesus to cover us. Um, so right now, this, this is a, a, a video clip. Uh, it's a for, he's a former um, Muslim. He's a medical doctor, and he became a follower of Christ. And I thought it was his... Uh, Part of his testimony is very interesting. Uh, so I'm going to go and Um, they are a lot. They, they are different than you. We've also become familiar with the radical Islamic. And, and, and part of his, I'm, I'm going to show a little segment of, of this particular, his name, Dr. Nabil uh, Qureshi. He, he, was, he was brought up as a Muslim, and he always believed that Islam was uh, peaceful up until 9-11. And then he was kind of devastated. He said, and he started examining his own faith. And he found out that, yeah, radical Islam is uh, a part of that, that belief system in violence. So this is, his name is Dr. Uh, Nabil Qureshi. And, and then they can also follow um, Dr. Qureshi at N.A. Qureshi um, on Twitter. So if y'all can join me in welcoming Dr. Qureshi. Good evening. I can, by the way, see you. I'm not on a TV screen, so I'll try that again. Good evening. Great. My name is Nabil Qureshi. It's an honor to be here. For those of you who are so inclined, please join me in prayer as we ask God to be here this evening. God, we ask that you would be here. God, we ask that it would be in a spirit of truth that we have our discussions. I pray that when we talk about matters of Islam and Christianity, which are so dear to people's hearts all around the world, God, I pray that we would understand that we're seeking matters of truth. And I pray that this wouldn't be something that would be a matter of fighting with other people or trying to get one up on someone, but rather I pray, God, that everything we do would be in order to seek the truth, to draw closer to our maker, the one true maker of this universe. And God, I pray that we would walk alongside other people, not in a spirit of adversarial uh, in dialogue, but one of truthful, open dialogue. And God, at the end of the day, I pray that in everything we do, we would please you. We pray this in your name. Amen.
for the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. In other words, in order to prove to you what I'm saying, you're asking me for a sign, I'll show you one sign. I'll be dead and in a grave for three days, in Sheol, in the heart of the earth for three days. And then I'll come out. Just as Jonah came out of that whale, I will come out from that grave. That's his claim to prove that Christianity is true. And can we see why then the resurrection is so important to the Christian faith? Can we see why then we have to see whether this actually happened? We have to investigate the evidence. It's our duty. Okay. The, the presentation is very long, so I'm just taking excerpts. And the next uh, excerpt is his, his comment on uh, 911, and then it's another. Um, a place that he, I thought was very, he summarizes all, everything that he's talking about at this uh, at the lecture. Uh. Mm -hmm. Thanks to Pastor Mint, he was reading a book called Seeking Allah and Finding Jesus. Right, that's this, right. And I read it, okay. and so I relate to all what he's saying. I'm this young man. I mean, he was battling with those Christians. Mm -hmm. They were in all kind of debates. And he, he, I mean, it took a long time for him to truly. It took him going to the Quran and trying to find where they are true, what they're saying, and then comparing it to, you know, the Bible. And I mean, it's, it's a good book if you can get it. It's, it's really fantastic. Thank you. Uh, uh, seeking Allah and finding Jesus. Ibn Hisham saved Ibn Ishaq's Sidat Rasulullah. Ibn Ishaq's Sidat Rasulullah has been lost to history. A man named Ibn Hisham saved it. And here is what Ibn Hisham says. He says, I found in Ibn Ishaq's work things that were so offensive, so impossible, that I have taken them out. What is left is those things that I have found true. So what is Ibn Hisham saying about Ibn Ishaq's Sidat Rasulullah? He's saying that it is not reliable, at least in the form in which it's found, and he has had to alter it. So what we have, the earliest source that we have on Muhammad's life, 150 years after Muhammad has died, and not exactly from then, a little bit later, but let's just say it is that, is an altered version of a source that Muslims at the time, Muslim scholars at the time, found untrustworthy in parts. That's what we have to start with. Okay? So this is before we've even gotten to the Hadith literature. This is still Sira literature. We've got Sira Maghazi happening here. Then we've got a few more. We have Ibn Sa'ad. We have um, a few others who happened. And then we get to the sources that Muslims consider the most reliable. Now, the most reliable source, according to Sunni Islam, now generally speaking, if someone says Muslim, they're referring to Sunni Muslims because 80% of Muslims around the world are Sunni. Uh, unless someone puts a qualifier in Shia or some other uh, denomination, um, generally speaking, you're talking about Sunni beliefs. Now, 80% of Muslims believe then that a book called Sahih al-Bukhari is the most trustworthy source on Muhammad's life. Sahih al-Bukhari was collected by a man named Imam Bukhari who wrote and died approximately 250 years after Muhammad's death. So now we're 250 years away. The next most trustworthy book is Sahih al-Muslim, written by a man named Imam Bukhari, and the two are not independent of one another. Imam Muslim was a student of Imam Bukhari, so they're not independent sources, but these are the two most reliable sources according to Muslims, Sunni Muslims. There's a lot more to this, by the way. There's Hadith methodology. There's, there's scholars who study the method of understanding Hadith. They look at Isnad, the train of transmission between Muhammad and the person who wrote these down, and they, they weigh the hadith uh, as uh, Mutawatir or Da'if or Ahad, you know, the strength of the hadith. They'll say some tra traditions are reliable, some are not. Regardless, what we're left with is these two as the most reliable sources. Now, what do these sources say about Muhammad? I don't want to go too far in detail, because it can be offensive, it can sound like I'm trying to bash Islam. But I... Once you read uh, Ibn Ishaq's Sirat Rasulullah, you do not walk away with the conclusion that this man is a prophet of God. Far from it, you see some tragedies that you would say are unconscionable. And again, I can answer those questions for you in the Q&A if you'd like. When you come to Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih al-Muslim, same thing. I, 
I was raised believing that Islam was a religion of peace. Um, that's, that's why when 9-11 happened, it shook me to the core. I, I was just shocked when 9-11 happened. I said, how can people attack innocent human beings in the name of Allah, who is a peaceful God? That's how I was taught it. And when I started studying Islam with my own eyes, instead of with what people had taught me, I come to Sahih al-Bukhari, I'm Sahih al-Muslim, volume 1, book 30. Volume 1 of Sahih al-Muslim, uh, hadith number 30. And what it says is, Allah, uh, Muhammad said that I will drive all uh, Jews and Christians out of the Arabian Peninsula. No, I'm sorry, that's Sahih al-Bukhari. Sahih al-Muslim um, is, uh, I will leave none alive except Muslims. I didn't believe it was true. I said, that must be a weak hadith. must be false. So I went to the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and it just kept piling on and on and on. All these hadith that made me think, this religion, I can't walk away from an objective perspective and say, this man is a prophet of God. I can defend him as a Muslim. I can throw out these hadith, and I can say, but Muhammad did it this in this, in this context, and this happened in this context, and you can start defending him. You can take a defensive posture, that's fine. But as an objective investigator coming to the books of hadith and the books of sirah, the historical records of Islam, you do not walk away feeling like there's an objective case that Muhammad is a prophet of God. Far from it. You start seeing him as a product of the 7th century, a natural product of the 7th century. All right, now to... I'm going to go to a point where he's just summarizing everything he's been um, speaking on during that, this evening. Um, Sure, defend it all you want. And I'm not up here arguing that the theology has been changed. I'm not arguing that. I think the early Muslims did an excellent job of preserving their theology. I'm just talking about the verbatim preservation of the Quran. There's no good reason to believe that once you look at the earliest sources, unless you're coming at it from a defensive angle. The last two arguments that Muslims use to defend the Quran, I'm just going to mention them briefly. One is mathematical patterns. They'll say there's beautiful mathematical patterns in the Quran. And another one is that there are prophecies in the Quran. When you come right down to them, you look at those mathematical patterns, they don't add up. And when you come down to those prophecies, they're not prophetic. And we can talk about those under Q&A time if you'd like. So, I'm going to end by saying this. As a Muslim then, I'm looking at these arguments. Three that all need to be strongly evidenced in order for Christianity to be true, and they were. At the earliest historical records, using the strongest historical criteria. Two arguments, either of which I needed to show in order for Islam to be true, and neither of them ended up being strong in the eyes of an objective observer. So what did I have to do? I had to make a choice. Do I follow the religion that I was raised with? Do I follow my family? Or do I dishonor them and pick something else? And for those of you who don't have a Middle Eastern or Eastern lineage, uh, it might be hard to grasp just how difficult it is to take everything your parents have given you and throw it back in their faces, which is not what I was doing, but that's how they interpreted it. Very difficult process, so difficult that I didn't do it. I did not do it. I convinced myself that Islam was true anyway, until I couldn't bear it anymore, and I asked in prayer, Allah, and I, was, I would pray to Allah, and I'd say, Allah, who are you? Are you Jesus, or are you Allah, the God of Islam? And I asked for dreams, because that's what I was taught to do as a Muslim. I would pray istikhara, the salat that we would ask Allah to give us a dream, to find, to tell us if something was true. So I asked God for dreams and visions. And he gave me a vision and three dreams, which pointed me to Christ. And uh, I'm not here to talk about my testimony. I'm here to give you the evidence. Um, but if, for those of you who are interested, this book comes out in February. You can read it there. So, in the end, I want to challenge you. No matter who you are in this room, if you're a Christian or if you're a Muslim, if you were raised by faith to believe something and you believed it without challenging it, without testing it, I urge you, I challenge you to go talk to people who disagree with you. Let them challenge you. Study these matters for yourself. Because when the winds come and the foundation shakes, if you don't have strong answers to these questions, you're going to be left without grounding. And in that time, that extremely painful time, you better believe you need a God to hold on to. And not just any God, the true God who can bear you through. So whether you're Christian, whether you're Muslim, whether you're neither, 
Find the truth. Search the truth. Don't have these questions ring around in your mind and not address them. A question under the surface left will fester like an infection. And even if you don't see it, it is destroying your flesh. It is destroying you to your bones. Air those doubts. Discuss them so that you can be solid, so that you can know with certainty. And pursue God, pursue truth by all means because God is the most beautiful, unimaginably wonderful being in this universe. And if he created you, if he gave you everything you have, I would challenge you to say you owe it to him to find out who he is. Or you can walk away. The choice is truly yours. Thank you. Some, you know, sometimes when a person comes from another tradition, I mean, basically, you know, often in Judaism, when a person converts from Judaism to Christianity, it costs you everything, your family relationships, everything. And uh, he, same thing, similar with uh, Dr. Uh, Qureshi. I'm, I'm going to show a clip of a question that was asked um, at the question and answer time. I thought it was interesting. Um, in, is more of his, a pers his personal um, encounter with Christ and how he was working through things. And um, so I'm going to fast forward to that part. Yes, Muhammad is an Ishmaelite. But from the critical scholastic, Western scholastic perspective, we don't know. Okay. Can I get back in line and ask another question? Go ahead. <laughs> and don't forget, I'll stick around afterwards in case you, you still have more. Sir. Good evening, Dr. Christian. Thanks again for your talk. I, too, am a medical doctor, so I really appreciated a lot of the aspects that you brought in from the medical standpoint. Sure. But just in your own personal journey through all this, was there anything during your residency, uh, anything during your medical training that also pointed you towards uh, the, the, I guess, the claims of Christ, uh, any other personal anecdotes you could think of? There are plenty of personal anecdotes. Thank you so much, Dr. Fritz, asking the question. There are plenty of personal anecdotes. I find that on a stage like this, if you share the personal anecdotes, they get mixed up with the uh, historical logical argumentation, and so people start saying, oh, you believe that because of this personal anecdote? Look how weak your beliefs are. And so generally speaking, I don't bring them up. But since we have distanced ourselves from that, um, I will argue, I will, I'll share this. I, I had become a Christian by this point, so uh, take that into account. When I was a third year medical student, I was doing ob rotations. And we were at a high-risk facility in Norfolk, Virginia. And so we got the worst of the worst. In my whole time, in my two months of ob rotations, I saw one family. Mm. Everyone else was single mothers or drug addicts or or what have you. Um, one night, a 15-year-old girl comes in, uh, in labor, and it turns out she was uh, not willing to have her baby, um, and so she had taken uh, a significant amount of crack cocaine, because she had heard that that would cause you to go into premature labor, and she did. Um, and uh, the baby was born, and um, I'm sorry, this is a difficult to remember. They had uh, uh, the baby being examined by the neonatologists and just uh, very small, very light, um, and breathing heavily and obviously on the verge of death. Mm -hmm. And I asked what the situation was. I, I knew about the baby before I knew about the mother. And so I asked what the situation was. They told me I went to see the mother. And I walked in the mother's room to ask her what had happened because they didn't tell me all the details. And I walked in, and I saw her texting, mm -hmm. and not a single care in the world, laughing, texting. And I asked her, What's going on? Uh, what are, are you concerned? Is this the right grown? Is this the right baby? And she would not refer to the baby as her. She would refer to her as it. It. It was just something that didn't matter. Now, where? How does? How does this play in? I was shocked that day. Absolutely shocked at the level of apathy. In fact, I almost I would say an anger welled up in me at the level of apathy towards this girl. And so I, I went and I started reading her her, her um, H and T. I started reading her records, and when I found out her history, she had been abused as a child. Her family all did drugs. 
She didn't have a, a father in the picture. And I'm reading this, and I say, who do I get angry at? Mm. Who, who am I supposed to be angry at here? Is it her? Is it the person who's supposed to be in her life and take care of her as a father? Is it the people who are supposed to protect her? From the, who do I get angry at? And for the first time, I was just furious at the sin in the world. And yet, all of a sudden, I had this desire to care for this girl. Despite what she had done, despite the heinous crime that she had just committed, killing another human being in my perspective, I had this desire to care for her. And all of a sudden, it hit me. And I'm not a father yet, but it hit me that the love of a father goes beyond any sin. The love of a father who understands their child goes beyond any sin. I think about my father, who I call Abba. If, if, if I sin against Abba, it doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter what I do. He would still love me. Yeah. Right. Now, the gospel message is that God is more loving than any human being we can imagine. If my father would forgive me no matter what, by definition, God has to be more loving than that. Yeah. Now, in Islam, it's clear in the Quran, God does not love those who are unrighteous. This isn't something I'm making up. It's in the Quran. God does not love the sinners. And so, as you look through the Qur'an, you don't have unconditional love. You have love for those who perform. Right. You have love for those who are good Muslims, but yeah. not unconditional love. And to me, that makes God less loving than a human, mm. which I don't think is possible. No way. And so, again, this is a personal anecdote. This is something that tied things together for me. The beauty of the gospel message is that God loves even those who sin because mm. he understands. And that for me was powerful. Thank you so much for asking the question. Thank you. Amen. Um, I just want to get some feedback, uh, comments, or questions before I go to the next segment. Se next segment, I'm just going to share a few scripture, try to tie things together. Is how I believe the Lord was kind of directing me personally. But uh, any. I was listening to a sermon on um, Islam and what they believe, and I was just listening to what he was saying. They do they cannot understand how God can be merciful and gracious and just. If he's just first, then there's no room for mercy and grace. And what the pastor was saying was that so beautiful that it's true about even our God. It's true, his justice. But his love for us was so great that he sent his son that he would pour out his wrath, the justice that we should deserve, which gives us the opportunity to experience his grace. So in Islam, if you're ever witnessing to them, you know, I don't even know if they might bring it up or not, but the justice, the mercy, and the grace, the justice, Jesus Christ, the wrath, all of that was poured out on him, substitutionary, his substitutionary death allows us to experience the mercy and grace Amen. of God. There's no, no grace in, in Islam. Yeah, I, no I'm grace. not gonna be long. I just, um, cause he can't talk about everything, and that's why I recommend if you have time to get that book, cause it, it really, goes in a lot of detail but one part of the book he when he was debating against the Christians his grandfather came along with him and I guess he thought he would be able to defend the Quran and the, the Muslim religion and he ended up walking out I mean he, he was they they did so much with pointing out Christianity right. he, he was overwhelmed and he just walked out just left, just left. He, he couldn't handle it you know, um, Dr. Qureshi talked about some of the, the beauty of his, he was raised as a Muslim and he, he loved it. He, that's just another question. What do you consider some of the beautiful aspects of your own faith, Christianity? Um, I know one of the aspects that's beautiful is that you mentioned the um, agape love, yeah. unconditional love. It's a beautiful aspect you don't find anywhere else. It's a be the, uh, but there's another beauty, I believe, that's even, that's, I think, on par. But I, uh, that's right. Yeah. There's, um, another beauty of uh, Christianity is that we 
uh, that separates us from all other religions is that we don't, we can't earn our way Amen. That, that Jesus does. Four Jesus did the work, Four but in all other religions, man has to work to God. Right. But in Christianity, God do all the work. Amen. God does all the work. You basically said what I was going to say <laughs> because they don't know the true and living God. They are following a man and that's why they are into works and every other religion other than those that are following Christ, you have to do something. And what can you do? If you, had, if you could have done something, Christ didn't have to die. And that's what I tried to tell people. I live next door to a Muslim, and we have conversations often. And he will agree a whole lot. Yeah, mm -hmm, yeah, you're right. Yeah, he died for our sins, but they will not accept him as God. They will not say he's God the Son. Right. No. They don't believe Jesus is God. Um, and he, I think, Sister, uh, okay. So. I'm going to go kind of move on now. Um, with that in mind, one th you might say, well, Dr. Qureshi, well, I, I, his experience was probably not some of your experience in coming to Christ. But we all have an experience when we came to Christ. But as I came to Christ, I remember years ago, I was um, presented with one aspect of Christianity where I'm going to go through a series of verses that kind of brings out this aspect. And you all, have, I'm sure, have heard of it, but I'm, maybe I'll focus in on it. It's called the Spirit of the Lord. The Holy Spirit was in the Old Testament, and he's in the New Testament. And he's, um, well, let me look at, let's look at a few verses. Book of Judges, chapter 3, verse 10. This is in just a summary of what's going on in Judges. Every time the Israelites rebelled, God would bring uh, retribution, and then they would repent, and then God would restore them, cycle after cycle. And they did evil in the sight of the Lord. And we are similar. We, uh, we can mess up, sin, would I lose our temper, do something, Lord, forgive me, and he restores us. And uh, in Judges 3, is, uh, 10 is speaking of the... Uh, the um, Judge Othniel, and every judge is a type of Christ. It says, the spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel. He went out to war, and the Lord delivered Cushan Rishathim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed over Cushan Rishathim. I think that's it. And another one speaks of Gideon. Gideon was a judge. But the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Then he blew the trumpet, and the Abizrites gathered behind him. In Judges 11, 20, 29, Jephthah, he was a judge. And he was kind of a rebel, ruthless, but it, God used him, Jephthah. And the, the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh and passed through Mizpah of Gilead and from Mitzvah of Gilead, he advanced toward the people of Ammon. Um, Samson was a judge, and he was a type of Christ. But God used Samson to deliver the Israelites. Even though Samson, was, he, was, he was rebellious. <laughs> and, um, but it says in Judges 3, 13, 25, then the Spirit of the Lord came, began to move upon him. And again, Samson in Judges 14, 6, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. Judges 14, 19, then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, and he went down to Eshkelon and killed 30, 30 of their men. And also in Judges 15, 14, when he came to Le Lehi, the Philistines came shouting against him. Then the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And in the New Testament, in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, in the, the day of Pentecost, when the church was born, it says, Then Peter said to them, 
Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And also in Acts 16, 17, this is Paul on his second missionary journey, and he, he wanted to go east and in uh, Acts 16, 7, in the New International Version, it says, when they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So even, see, this, even in the New Testament, Paul was directed by the Holy Spirit. And the beauty, one of the beauty, beautiful things of Christianity is God, our creator, lives in us. So when we receive Jesus, we have his spirit Amen. and his power. And it's, um, and I, sometimes I, I can forget, it's not me. And we get, uh, what do you do? We depend on ourselves to self-effort, self-sufficiency, self-sufficiency to live the Christian life. And it's uh, indoctrinated in us, it's drilled in us, be self-sufficient, be, don't depend on nobody, but as true believers, we ultimately are dependent on Jesus Christ, his spirit. We can't live it on, on our own, in our own efforts. Romans 8, 11, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give, you, give to you more, your mortal body, bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. So one beautiful aspect of Christianity is that God lives in us and we have access to his, his, that power, dunamis, when we um, are filled with his spirit. Uh, in Ephesians, um, Ephesians 5, 17, it says, therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And I just, once again, that's a beautiful aspect. God is willing to live in us if we allow him. And last week, what I did, I ordered this. There's a man, I'm going to show a clip. His wife was kind of giving a testimony. I showed that, if you remember that, uh, it's called the, the Spirit-filled life. The, the natural person, the carnal person, the spiritual person. And Bill, uh, Dr. Bright, the founder of Campus Crusade, he tried to summarize um, this, how you to be filled with the Spirit, it's, and it's done through faith. Um, his wife, I think, gave a great um, practical illustration of what it means to uh, allow the Spirit of, uh, of the Lord to, to, uh, to indwell us, to guide us, to lead us, and us. I have about five minutes, so I'm going to go on to that that clip and I have I ordered some booklets if anyone interested they should be here next Sunday so I'm a, uh, anyone that wants them I'll pass them out and you can study it on your own uh, but her name is her, uh, Bill Bright's wife her name was Von, her name is Vonette Bright uh, Bill Bright passed away a few years ago but this is how uh, she describes the spirit the spirit filled life Bill knew the reality of the Holy Spirit in his own life, but at the same time to be able to make that transferable to other people, that he could uh, put it into a form that people could understand. So he, he was collecting every book he could possibly find that had something on the Holy Spirit and insight into the scriptures about the meaning of the Holy Spirit. And so we took a, a vacation to Dr. Fuller's uh, beach home in Balboa Beach and Zach and I enjoyed the beach. Bill, immediately when we got there and unpacked, he had been saving shirt boards <laughs> from the cleaners that, that had a piece of cardboard in it and he had been saving those. He liked to make notes on those and they made a good writing pad. So he had been saving stacks of these shirt boards and so he took this, all of his books on the Holy Spirit and took these shirt boards and he began that night, even after we were unpacked, I went to bed and went to sleep. I don't know how long Bill worked, but 
He worked around the clock as much as he possibly could in devouring these books that he had. So that was the beginning of Ye Shall Receive Power. And uh, the little blue books that we used, just with the, kind of the formula, the basic formulas, in giving thanks, praising God in the difficulties, allowing Him to control the circumstances, to give in quickly, and, uh, and just to... I don't think of any better way to say it than just to allow Him to live His life in and through us. It takes the struggle out of the Christian life. And I think that that message transformed the staff of Campus Crusade for Christ for, for all of us. I can remember, for example, that I was struggling with making this really real in my own my own life. I wanted to be able to say I was living the Christian life, but it was it was a struggle. And uh, and I knew that it shouldn't be a struggle from what I was hearing of the spiritual life. And uh, and yet, how do you make it different? I remember uh, just trying so hard to be the wife that Bill Bright wanted me to be, but I was working myself half to death, and I was in my own strength. I, I learned that, you know, I couldn't keep from losing my temper over certain things, but God could, and I learned to depend upon the Holy Spirit's control. And to say, confess, confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you your, your sin and, and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I knew that verse, and so I began just to simply talk to myself a lot. Lord, I confess that I'm resentful. You take over. Lord, I confess that I am irritated by this inter interruption. Now, how can I uh, exalt you in this situation and you just take over? Oh, I remember the telephone rang rather early, and uh, that I thought, oh, this telephone, it just is incessant, just ringing off the wall. Why don't people leave us alone? Why do we have to call at this early hour in the morning? And uh, I thought, I could just break that thing out of there, rip that thing out of the wall. And then as I got on the phone, as I answered the phone, I answered, hello? Yeah. Happy, happy? And... Uh, <laughs> The person on the other end of the line said, Oh, it's always so great to call your house. You are always so up on it. It was Cliff Barrows, who was the song leader for Billy Graham. And I thought, Oh, how impossible, how impossible is this? But through that teaching and through the, uh, the practice, really, of allowing Christ to control our lives, it's been the salvation of our ministry, and I think the greatest contribution probably to the cause of Christ that Bill has made is in the area of believing God for the impossible and, and depending upon the Holy Spirit, that, that message of, uh, of the exchange life, allowing Christ to live his life in and through each one of us. And it gives so much more strength than we know that it's not you doing it, it's God doing it. And Bill used to pray often, Lord, do everything about this ministry in such a way that only God will get the credit. I'm sorry. Uh, it's God who wants to get the glory. Thank you. And whenever I do something for Christ, it's he should get the glory. That's, that's the purpose of our lives, to give God the glory. In every aspect, every tribulation, whatever we go through, even in problems, I'm learning that when you go through probably like these tailor-made frustrations and problems for Ronald, <laughs> it's to give him, learn to give him the, the, the praise and honor. And so, um, so that's one of the beautiful aspects of Christianity. So I'm going to just close in prayer. Uh, Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you that you have created us and you have made a way for us to know you because of the love that you showed to us, unconditional love. 
Thank you, Lord, for all your blessings uh, poured out upon us. Help us, Lord, to live lives that uh, give you the glory. I pray this in your name. Amen.